Hate groups hold rallies that turn deadly in Charlottesville, Virginia. Is free speech crossing a line into crime? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmakers are America's white supremacists. You pretend to be patriots, but you're anything but. Angry words from the governor of Virginia. Terry McAuliffe lashed out after a suspected white supremacist plowed a car into a group of anti-racism protesters. One person was killed, 19 others were injured. Both Democratic and Republican lawmakers united in not just condemning the attacker, but also the hate groups who'd gathered in the city of Charlottesville, with one big exception, the President of the United States. Donald Trump said displays of hatred, bigotry, and violence occurred on many sides. Yvette McCullough has more. They may have been the largest public rallies of white supremacists in recent U.S. history, inciting outrage and a deadly attack. Hundreds of white supremacists and neo-Nazis descended on Charlottesville, Virginia on Friday to protest against the removal of a statue of famous Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Love against tyranny and oppression. That's what that statue means. They gathered again on Saturday and were met by counter demonstrations, leading to violent clashes. Several people were injured and one woman was killed after a man rammed his car into a crowd of counter protesters. The governor of Virginia declared a state of emergency. And I have a message to all the white supremacists and the Nazis who came into Charlottesville today. Go home. You are not wanted in this great commonwealth. Shame on you. You pretend that you're patriots, but you are anything but a patriot. White supremacist rally organizer Jason Kessler also condemned the violence, but blamed police for failing to ensure they were able to exercise their First Amendment right to protest in peace. The hate that you hear around you, that is the anti-white hate that fueled what happened yesterday. For many people, the events signified a resurgence of violent racist sentiment, now being displayed en masse in the open, and some argue without official censure. U.S. President Donald Trump has been criticized for his reaction, which failed to explicitly condemn neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. On many sides. Many sides. Two words that sparked a firestorm of criticism across the political divide. Republican Senator Marco Rubio tweeted that it's very important for the nation to hear the President of the United States describe events in Charlottesville for what they are, a terror attack by white supremacists. While Senator Cory Gardner tweeted a message to the President that we must call evil by its name, these were white supremacists and this was domestic terrorism. Throughout his election campaign, Trump was accused of inciting or not doing enough to stop far-right hate speech and violence. His initial failure to disavow support from the Ku Klux Klan and its former leader David Duke was seen as a dangerous dog whistle to his groundswell of far-right supporters. There is also criticism that these views are entrenched in the highest levels of the White House, with top advisors like Steve Bannon and Sebastian Gorka having reported links to racist and anti-Semitic groups. The White House has since issued a statement clarifying Trump's condemnation was intended for white supremacists too. But as the US struggles with deep divisions, is that clarification too late? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss the events in Charlottesville and more, let's join our panel now from Washington. We have Kelly Jane Torrance. She's deputy editor at the conservative magazine, The Weekly Standard. In Los Angeles, Melina Abdullah, she is an organizer for the Black Lives Matter movement. 
as well as a professor and chairwoman of the Pan-African Studies program at California State University. And from the UK, Tom Brooks, professor of law and government at Durham University. Thanks all so much for joining us. Let me just get each of your opinions on one statement here. What did Trump mean when he condemned hatred and bigotry on many sides, other than the white supremacists? Kelly Jane, let me start with you. Whom was he talking about? Well, I think it's pretty clear he was talking about the people that were out counter-protesting, the white supremacists. And we have heard reports since uh, that police had trouble, that people were just fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat earlier in the day. But those reports kind of came later, and they weren't uh, really the focus of what was going on in Charlottesville, and they were not the reason that there was a fatality. It seems pretty clear. The evidence is on the video. Obviously, he has to go through a trial. But it looks pretty clear that a white nationalist who attended the march injured at least a couple dozen people and killed one person. So for Donald Trump to say that he condemns hatred and bigotry on many sides without specifically noting the people who were responsible for the worst and most deadly violence uh, over the weekend uh, was really quite shocking, and, and not just to, to Democrats, but even Republicans, as you mentioned uh, in your package, that Republicans like Marco Rubio, Cory Gardner, John McCain, others have been so disgusted by the president's lack of honesty on this that they have spoken out against him. Melina, go ahead. Yes, um, this notion that one, that we're only condemning hatred and bigotry. We need to think about Charlottesville is not just um, an exercise in hatred and bigotry, but in white supremacy. And then the notion that um, the folks who are defending our right to live, to be vocal, to be present, to not be subject to further oppression, um, are equally responsible for our own oppression and our own deaths is just appalling. So this notion that it's just um, a condemnation of hatred and bigotry and not the actual act of oppression is problematic, as is the notion that the um, oppressed are equally responsible for their oppression as those who continue to oppress and assail them um, is a huge um, issue and I think is indicative of Trump as complicit in white supremacy. Melina, let me ask you, though, some of Trump's advocates have criticized the Black Lives Matter movement because they say, when you say Black Lives Matter, you're somehow saying that white lives don't matter or matter less. How do you... So, go ahead. So I think we should be clear that black people are very capable of speaking in complete sentences. And di if we meant only black lives matter, we would say that. But when we say black lives matter, that's what we mean. Black lives matter. And those who um, proclaim to value all lives should have absolutely no problem saying black lives matter if they truly um, care about and value all folks. Do you think you're getting that message out clearly enough, though, because Trump people have been able to to use it against you well I think that they've been able to use it against us with the audience that they choose to use it against us with I think that um, folks who are um, open-minded and are really honest about what what it is we're fighting for really understand Black Lives Matter. So we're now four years old. I think the majority of this country and um, folks around the world understand that when we say Black Lives Matter, what we're doing is lifting up the specificity of the violence experienced by black people. We can't simply say, you know, we want to fight for all folks when it's um, um, in this instance, when it's black folks who are under constant attack. And we have the right to do that, and we have a responsibility to say those who are most under attack should be lifted up and protected. And that's what Black Lives Matter means. And that's why people like um, our white ally, Heather Heyer, who was killed um, a couple days ago, um, are marching with us and standing with us and saying, we need to stand up for black people because they are the folks who are under constant attack in the most extreme forms of okay. attack. Okay, Tom, let me first get your initial thoughts based on what you've heard, and then I'd like to go and ask you about some of the legal issues here. Go ahead. Well, my reaction to Trump's words uh, was uh, I didn't hear the word terrorism uh, in them, amongst uh, many others. Uh, you, 
When we had someone born and bred in Britain drive a car into uh, pedestrians, um, this was called very quickly a terrorism incident, and it was. Uh, he was very quick to condemn that and call it as such. Someone does something very similar in America, and he doesn't call it that, doesn't seem to acknowledge it. Uh, lumps it in together with all the bit of melee on the side, um, as if these things were all somehow morally equivalent or not worthy of any further comment. And I think, you know, with his office as a very hugely symbolic uh, office, I'm, of course, an American and a uh, British uh, citizen. And, and in America, you know, past presidents would try to unify the country, bring people together, whatever party they were uh, representing. And it was striking to me that he didn't seem to really try that or care too much about doing that at a time when the nation needed him to. Okay. Tom, let me ask you. We have a definition of hate crime in the United States and in the UK where you are. Why mm -hmm. can't they criminalize hate speech as well, especially when it triggers violence and hatred? Well, hate speech is a very difficult thing to know in a, some, to some degree when you have it. You might say, well, look, you have people walking around carrying torches and doing horrible slogans and other types of things. In the United States, you, of course, you have a different uh, view of, uh, well, First Amendment rights. We don't have a, 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 a written constitution in Britain, so there will be a different legal tradition. Over here, there would be more restrictions on the types of speech people would be allowed to do in public. Um, so there would be more control by the Home Office on what kinds of expression would be allowed on the streets for fear of what kinds of incitement might uh, follow afterwards. In America, as you will know, that there's a very different tradition of allowing far right or other far left uh, groups to march in areas that, uh, that, that might be kind of trying to make a reaction or uh, stimulate something of that kind, and that's been allowed. Um, I think that you know the issue here is not so much people being allowed to exercise First Amendment rights to say you know that they don't like certain things or would like the world a different way. I think that's that's all right to some degree. I think the issue here is when it boils into a violence when people get behind their vehicles and start driving into people who are not like them. Um, I think that's when there's a real turning point, and it shouldn't be just seen as as murder. It was something much worse than that. Okay. Um, and when those who have tried to willfully incite others think that is something that should be prosecuted. Okay, Kelly Jane, let me see what page you're on there. Should the U.S. criminalize hate speech? No, not at all, and it can't with, as we have the First Amendment in this country, as uh, Tom just pointed out. And no, I think it's, I mean, I think it's actually a very bad thing to send people with unsavory views underground. I think it's better to let them say their, you know, peace in the open and have people respond to them, point out why they're wrong. You know, first of all, you don't want to drive these people underground and, you know, people might, you know, start to like their ideas and not see how much people disagree with them and hear arguments against them. And you also don't want to set up this thing where in America, who decides what's hateful and what's not? You know, you pointed out with Black Lives Matter, your, the other guest gave a very, I thought, eloquent statement about why they call their group Black Lives Matter. And there are some people in this country who don't like Black Lives Matter, and they might decide that that's hate speech. And of course, are they in power now? Let's hope not. But that could happen one day, and you don't want to get set up where the government is allowed to decide what counts as hate and what doesn't, because we might not always agree with the government that's in power. And Melina, are you on the same page there, or do you feel there should be a limit when hate speech incites violence and or crime? I think that there's a difference between hate speech um, and freedom of speech. Um, so hate speech, we need to be clear, should not be criminalized, but it is unprotected speech. And so I'm sure Tom can talk about that difference. So when we talk about folks engaging in hate speech, that speech is not protected. Um, I think what we're talking about with Charlottesville is not just a matter of speech. We're talking about hate incidents. We're talking about um, uh, exercises which are meant to incite violence. Those are violent acts. When you talk about confronting um, folks who just happen to be students or um, professors or community members at a place like University of Virginia with um, triggering um, acts like carrying of torches and um, talk about what it means to take a country back from 
and, and we can, you know, kind of go into that, that it was ne never belonged to um, the so-called white nationalists in the first place, what that means. This extends beyond speech, and we're seeing this erupt all around our country. On my very own campus last year, there was an effort to kind of incite violence among our majority black and brown student community by folks on the right. Um, the alt-right who showed up on our campus. So this is not just a matter of speech. This is a matter of inciting violence, um, of engaging in ways that are harmful. And when we talk about speech, yes, the First Amendment um, is a hugely important um, part of American culture and of who we are as the United States. At the same time, it does not trump um, no pun intended, the safety of our people. And so when we talk about folks um, really not just expressing their views, but attacking with words and with action people, then that goes beyond hate speech, that goes beyond freedom of speech. Okay, Tom, let me get uh, your perspective on that, especially given that the white supremacists in this scenario complained very vocally that they were not given sufficient police protection that taxpayer-funded police should have been responsible for protecting their hate-fueled rallies. Yeah, well, I, I think everything that the last commentator said was, well, the last two have said, I, I agree with the, the, the substantive points about the First Amendment. Of course, not only is, is hate speech unprotected speech, but it's also the case that a freedom of speech is not a freedom to say anything anywhere, anytime, as you like. There are limits to what can be said and, and in a sense, what you can be protected for uh, saying as well. Shouting fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire is something for which you can get into an awful lot of trouble, both in America and over here in Britain, rightly so. I think that the idea that the police did not give them enough protection, um, they say that there were some melees and some other uh, problems. I think, well, we'll have to see the police reports and, and how they saw that end of things. I think to, to, to blame the police for, I don't know, I mean, the white supremacists seem to be very worried about the protection of their people and, and their rally, and not so worried about the, 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 the truck or vehicle driven by one of their supporters into uh, their opponents and, you know, the, what the police did or did not do uh, about that. I, I, I don't think the issue here really was about the police um, uh, not doing enough. I think that people were doing this march, were out to uh, cause a stir. They, they, they really uh, did cause one. They wanted to uh, get people uh, riled up and, and make a statement and, and send out a message to the world. They certainly have done that and, and deeply embarrassed America from outside America, I can tell you, yeah. uh, in the process. Okay, well, let me uh, bring in another issue here. If, if the, the police, perhaps in the law, uh, can't do much right now to curb um, this kind of hate speech. There are now activists online that are trying to identify those who took part in that white supremacist rally by, in a sense, naming and shaming. So one of the Twitter handles uh, used was called Yes, You're Racist. And in this case, it identified this man, we can see him there, as Cole White, whose employer apparently sacked him after seeing this tweet uh, that we're seeing on screen. Uh, tweets also outed this University of Nevada student. Uh, the school issued a statement there saying it won't be divided by hateful language and violence. And uh, the Twitter account is asking if anyone goes to school with this man, whom we're seeing, <laughs> seeing on screen. Uh, Kelly, Jane, let me ask you, I, I know you've seen these tweets. Uh, do you think that's, that's the approach, the, the right approach here? People need to take this into their own hands, speak up for what's right, and this naming and shaming using social media could be one way to do it. Well, it's certainly uh, been effective, and you know, it's really quite amusing. The University of Nevada student, he actually, I read an interview with him in which he was saying, oh, I'm not the angry racist it looks like I am in the photo. And of course, it's, you know, his comments were ridiculous. And you know, he, if he if he really believes in what he believes, he's willing to go to a rally and and you know hold a torch and yell out those things, and he should be willing to be identified publicly. I mean, this wasn't a private meeting by any stretch of the imagination, and they were purposely looking for media coverage. I mean, that's the sad thing about all this is, you know, in a way they got what they wanted in that, hey, we're talking about these people. But no, I, I think there's nothing wrong with naming and shaming people. And if, you know, if they, if they live in a state that has right to work laws and their employer can fire them for whatever reason, then that's what they're going to have to think about. And I think it's good that we're showing that this is not acceptable 
meaningful conversation for younger people, for people who might not realize, hey, they might be attracted to some of these ideas for whatever reason, and they need to see that, hey, you know what, the vast majority of Americans do not consider this acceptable, and you better think about why you support this kind of thing if you're thinking about it. Right, and I'd like to finish with the words then of Republican Senator Orrin Hatch, who had originally made news uh, for giving Trump a pass when he wouldn't reject support from former Klan leader uh, David Duke. But then he tweeted, we should call evil by its name. My brother didn't give his life fighting Hitler for Nazi ideas to go unchallenged here at home. Melina, is that what you want to hear from our leaders in the United States regarding this kind of, of hateful speech and rallies? Yes, that's the rhetoric. Um, that's definitely along the lines of the rhetoric that we want to hear, but we also want to have action. So um, it's wonderful that people are stepping up and saying that this is not what we want to be associated with, but we also want action. We want folks to understand that when we talk about um, the climate, um, the political climate that's empowered these white supremacists, um, we have to undo it. We have to say that, you know, we understand that Trump having people like Steve Bannon in the White House um, and Gorka in the White House have empowered folks. Um, David Duke's own words are that Trump is in because we voted him in. He is our president. That, that's, that's the sentiment um, held by these white supremacists. And so we want action. We want um, if if Sessions is going to go around and say, you know, we need to use stronger language, we want to see prosecutions of folks who engage in white supremacist domestic terrorism. We want to see them charged. We want to see um, the safety of people valued ahead of um, hate speech, which is not protected, protected speech. We want to see action beyond rhetoric. Okay, Melina Abdullah, I will have to give you the last word because very unfortunately we're out of time. But thank you all so much for joining us. Kelly Jane Torrance there from D.C., Tom Brooks from the U.K. Thanks for being on this edition of the Newsmakers. Still to come, we head to Marawi in the Philippines to find out how residents are coping under martial law. And will a corruption scandal lead to the downfall of Israel's prime minister? Welcome back to the Newsmakers. All week long, we'll be bringing you special reports from the Philippines, and we begin with the siege of Marawi. Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte's ongoing military operation there is designed to eliminate what the government says is a growing foothold for Daesh fighters. But some in the Muslim community say martial law has led to an increasing number of human rights abuses. It could also disrupt a developing peace plan with separatist groups in the region. Randolph Nogle reports now from Marawi. My orders really are to wipe them out. Everyone. President Rodrigo Duterte said it would be over in a matter of days. But it is stretched into months. The Marawi operation began on May 23rd with a failed attempt to capture the leader of Daesh's syndicate in the Philippines, Isnalan Hapsalon. Hundreds of militants then fanned out across the city, attacking key sites, including the city's military base and jail. This is where the fighting began. A few months ago, the militants had occupied most of Marawi. Now they control about 500 buildings in the east of the city. But for those who used to live here, the military says it's still not safe for them to return home. This street was once busy with commerce, but is now devoid of life. That place are, uh, look like a uh, ghost town. With martial law extended until the end of the year, many of those displaced are losing hope that they will be allowed to soon return home. For Narida, the crackdown to root out suspected militants has left her wondering whether her husband will ever return. Police told her he's a terror suspect 
because he fixed a motorcycle belonging to a member of Maute, a group allied with Daesh. Some of those among the 400,000 people displaced have banded together to form civil society groups. In addition to helping the federal government get aid to those who need it, they're looking into cases like Narita's. Juari, like other volunteers here, was forced out of his home by the fighting. Our rights is not uh, suspended, but uh, unfortunately, uh, on the ground, uh, many complaints, they violate their rights. He says his organization is working to make sure what happened in Marawi doesn't repeat itself. Many young, young ones now, they cannot understand what happened. What, we, what they only saw is that some of, some, not, not all the security, some of the security sectors are, are harassing them. Mindanao, the Philippines' second largest island, is home to a centuries-long battle for what is known as the Bangsamoro struggle for self-determination. The problems in Malawi is the result of a long-standing contestation, but this time it is advanced or um, advanced by uh, so-called radical Islamic groups. People in and around Marawi are Maranao, or people of the lake one of the ethno-linguistic Muslim groups that comprise the Bangsamoro. Their home is as abundant with natural beauty as it is racked with poverty and youth unemployment. What some say is a ripe combination for Daesh to exploit. Jamal lives in a predominantly Muslim community where some displaced from Marawi have taken refuge, including his own relatives. Uh, Marano is very different from other tribes here in the uh, Philippines. They are very uh, obedient, following their uh, leaders, although they are against, but they will not speak. That is uh, how the situation is. While there are concerns over how martial law is being implemented, the government says it's still widely popular. There is great support for martial law in Mindanao, amongst Mindanaoans. Maybe there are those who had suffered from this uh, in their own way, and we can understand their discomfort, uh, their challenging statements against martial law. But that is not a preponderant position by many in Mindanao. Some praise the Duterte administration for not dealing in half measures. But there are quiet signs of the fear here of being accused or even targeted. In a place that has not seen lasting peace for generations. Randolph Nogle, the newsmakers in Mindanao. To speak more about the situation in Marawi, I'm joined from Manila by the spokesman for the Philippine Armed Forces, General Restituto Padilla. Thank you so much for joining us, General Padilla. First of all, help us better understand the threat that your troops are up against in Marawi. And is martial law genuinely necessary to be able to combat that threat? Oh, yes. Uh, first off, Andrea, thank you for having me. And uh, in answer to your first question, we are up against a force consisting of local terrorist groups uh, who have combined forces uh, from uh, the 23rd of May in the area of Marawi and joined by a few elements of foreign terrorists from uh, primarily Southeast Asia and a few from uh, the Middle East, the exact number of which uh, we believe not uh, to be more than 40. And uh, this group has uh, taken up arms after we have tried to serve a warrant on the afternoon of the 23rd to effect the arrest of a known local leader by the name of Hapilon. And having preempted uh, some of their plans, which were supposed to have taken place uh, three days after, on the 26th of May, at the beginning of Ramadan in the local area, uh, we were able to preempt a bigger plan that they uh, were trying to hatch. Now, this uh, local conflict, a rebellion of uh, some sort, has been ongoing since the 23rd of May and now on its 84th day here in the Philippines. Now, the martial law that was imposed has been very helpful in arresting the spread of this rebellion. 
because we have enough uh, forces that have been laid down to affect the contagion that can possibly happen in other areas of Mindanao, particularly in the areas of uh, Sulu, Basilan, Tawi-Tawi, and areas of other parts of Lanao and uh, Maguindanao, where sympathetic forces may be present and uh, may want to create diversionary action or uh, better still uh, come up with a sizable force to reinforce or help those already in Marawi. So by and large, the imposition of martial law has been very helpful for this effort and uh, is a clearly beneficial step that has taken by government to arrest the rebellion. Okay, General, but you had long dealt with separatist groups and rebel groups and extremist groups in the Philippines. But today, with the imposition of martial law and the way the authorities under President Duterte have been handling those threats, some say you're using a sledgehammer to crack a peanut. Um, why do you think that is not the case? Well, it's really not the case. If you've seen images of the battle zone and the number of deaths that have occurred, well, the message is very clear that this is not mere peanuts that's, uh, that uh, has been uh, uh, accused or uh, mentioned by other parties. This is really and essentially a rebellion of some sort that if not controlled properly and if not arrested, could ignite uh, a bigger problem in other parts of Mindanao and even perhaps the region. That's why it was imperative that the armed forces take a stronger stand and become proactive in dealing with the network that may be in place all over Mindanao. That is why, as I mentioned earlier, martial law has been beneficial. Although uh, martial law here uh, essentially only canceled the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, it uh, essentially provides us the opportunity to effect an arrest without getting a search warrant or uh, an arrest warrant and uh, search uh, other areas without the benefit of a search warrant. But by and large, there has been uh, no drastic uh, violation of any rights of, some, of any sort because we have been very careful to respect the rights of law-abiding citizens and direct our actions only at those that have been violating the law or are part of the rebellion itself. That is why there, are, there have been uh, about close to 200 arrests that have been made of known personalities who may be harboring rebels or have been assisting the rebellion. Okay. I'd like to bring in journalist Dean Bernardo, who can join us as well from Manila. Dean, thanks so much uh, for joining us. You just heard the general say there that they've made sure that they are respecting the rights of law-abiding citizens, but some of our journalists have been to the Philippines themselves and have said that innocent people are being drawn in. Uh, they've been guilty, the forces have been guilty of human rights abuses among innocent people, and we are hearing human rights organizations as well complain of the same. What do you see, as a civilian yourself, who also lived under martial law in the Philippines, what do you see as the situation in Marawi? The big difference right now, it's, uh, it's a controlled situation right now. It's limited to the island of Mindanao. Unlike martial law during my time as a civilian, we were uh, considered this uh, one of the victims of martial law during, uh, mar uh, during the regime of Mr. Marcos. But right now, it's been very carefully orchestrated by the armed forces. There has been uh, checks and balances. The big difference there is during the martial law of the 70s, we will not be able to hear any of these complaints. And right now, uh, there are certain groups who have filed uh, complaints before the Commission of Human Rights earlier today, and I think General Padilla is aware of this, that uh, there have been some uh, so-called bakwits or evacuees who have said, uh, try to return to Marawi and have disappeared. Now, the families have filed complaints before or uh, attempting to file a complaint before the Commission on Human Rights. Now, this this was not possible during the time of Mr. Marcos. Now, this is a war, and we've seen how violent it is. We've seen how beautiful Marawi been considered to just destroy. Dean, I'm going to wait a few seconds to come back to you. We're going to try and rectify some audio issues, it seems, we're having with your connection there. But let me ask the general first. 
we, some of our journalists spoke to, as I said before, what they believe are innocent people uh, that have been wrongfully arrested and are imprisoned at present, as far as they know, uh, based on connections that they believe, the authorities believe they have to Daesh militants in the area. They are getting publicity now. Those stories are coming out. Do you fear that eventually more of these stories could actually hurt the government's credibility, its popularity, and ultimately its ability to fight extremists? Well, you see, uh, all of these complaints that are coming out are uh, most welcome. In fact, we have created hotlines for the purpose of hearing out complaints such as this. And we're not uh, close to hearing any of these kinds of complaints because we're open to it. As we have mentioned all along, we are an accountable organization and we will not tolerate from among ourselves any abuses that may have been committed against the right of uh, innocence. And uh, the armed forces is a stickler for compliance to international humanitarian law and uh, respect for human rights. And we will not uh, allow our soldiers to violate any of uh, all these laws. That is why if any of the citizens that you have mentioned has enough proof and are willing to come out in court and bring it out in the open for a proper investigation, we will cooperate fully and ascertain whether what they have been accusing the armed forces or the police of is true at all. So this openness to this kind of process is actually part of the democratic process that we have followed in the Philippines. And we will not be immune to that. Okay. Dean, let me ask you. Many Filipinos, as you are very aware, complain of corruption. Yet, it seems that right now they trust their police and their armed forces to impose martial law, arguably fairly. Um, how do you feel this can genuinely be fair? How can you have it both ways? When you have such belief that there's so much corruption in the armed forces and the police forces in, in the Philippines, yet they trust those same forces to impose martial law and fairly root out extremists. The big difference right now are the uh, these corruption are being addressed. Again, that's the big difference from before. Uh, right now, we have uh, means of filing complaints. We have grievances. And uh, the armed forces and even the Philippine National Police have been doing its part in trying to address this uh, uh, possible acts of corruption. And the trust there is that they're doing, they're doing their part. There may be some excess, so to speak. I've seen some that uh, may be brutal in, in some ways, but it, it boils down to some of us, uh, some of the Filipinos are saying it is necessary action to address the threats of terrorism in this country. Okay, General Padilla, let me ask you on that threat of terrorism, slight gear shift here. How much do you think Daesh has empowered extremist ideologies and extremist groups in the Philippines? Well, you see, the entry of the Daesh uh, actually was an opportunity for uh, our local terrorist groups to find a beacon to follow, uh, much uh, the way they did with the Jemaya Islamiyah and the Al-Qaeda previously. But now that the J.I. and the uh, Al-Qaeda are no longer uh, uh, in the horizon, uh, being uh, past uh, terrorist organizations that have lost their reason for being, they now see the Daesh as uh, a beacon to follow, and that's why many of the local terrorist groups have pledged their allegiance to this uh, group. But seeing the twilight of the Daesh over in the Middle East, and uh, the proactive stance being taken by our government and our armed forces, along with the other partners in the region who are concerned about this development, we, we hope to address uh, any kind uh, of growth. We'll stem the growth of these groups and hopefully deal with this rising uh, tide of uh, allegiance from the local terrorist group. There, there are not that many, really, and we have addressed many of them already. And uh, as far as we are concerned we will be able to continue to address this in the period that was given to us uh, for the rest of the year while we have martial law. Okay. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. General Padilla and Dean Bernardo both joining us there from Manila. Thanks so much for that. 
Well, Benjamin Netanyahu is on course to become Israel's longest serving prime minister. The Likud party leader has held that office for 11 years, but that could all be undone by a series of corruption scandals. Police have questioned Netanyahu, and a judge says their investigation could lead to criminal charges. The so-called Case 1000 looks at accusations Netanyahu offered favors in exchange for gifts, including cigars, jewelry, and champagne from wealthy friends. That includes Israeli Hollywood producer Arnon Milchan. Meanwhile, Case 2000 deals with recordings of Netanyahu allegedly trying to make a backdoor deal with the owner of one of Israel's largest newspapers. He's accused of seeking favorable coverage in exchange for curtailing a competing newspaper. Let's get more on that now with our panel. And from Tel Aviv, we have Neri Zilber. He is a fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And from Modin is Ksenia Svetlova. She's a member of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, representing the Zionist Union Party. Thanks both so much for joining us. Neri, let me just start with you. How serious a threat do you think all this is to Netanyahu's political career? Well, it's uh, quite a serious threat. Uh, the fact that these investigations have been ongoing for uh, over a year now, uh, the fact that uh, investigators and prosecutors here in Israel have taken it this far uh, indicates that there might actually be a fire behind all of this smoke. Um, and obviously, most recently, last week, Netanyahu's uh, former chief of staff uh, actually turned state's witness against him uh, in one, two, and perhaps more uh, of the cases uh, that Netanyahu is suspected of being a, uh, a suspect in. Uh, so it's quite serious. Uh, but having said that, uh, I don't think it's quite the end of Netanyahu's reign just yet. Because let me ask you, you mentioned his former chief of staff, Ari Haro, and there was a piece that in the Jerusalem Post, actually, where Haro had said, listen, I, both of us are innocent, basically. I have not turned into a rat here. I am not here to bring Netanyahu down. Uh, what do you make of that? If he doesn't have that turned witness, he could survive this, could he not? Well, Harrow, uh, the chief of staff now turned state witness, um, would say that. Uh, these were leaks uh, via close associates of Harrow. Um, the facts, quite frankly, speak otherwise. Um, he cut a deal with, uh, with authorities here uh, last week. Uh, it's quite a good deal, and you don't make that deal with authorities unless you, uh, you happen to be guilty uh, of a crime yourself. Uh, so he's getting quite a good deal for offering testimony uh, against his former boss, uh, Netanyahu. Okay. Ksenia, when you hear Netanyahu call this a political witch hunt and that politicians like you are trying to undermine the majority of the Israeli electorate who actually supports a more right-wing conservative ideology, what do you say? Well, first of all, um, I see a very weak prime minister, prime minister whose last uh, resort is uh, to attack his traditional enemies, the left and the media. But this time, he, I think, went uh, stepped uh, beyond the red line because he basically attacked every Israeli citizen uh, who destates uh, the horrible corruption uh, that uh, is uh, now so vivid uh, in uh, the office of the prime minister, but also around him. Uh, his whole Byzantic kind of court uh, is uh, uh, saturated uh, with, uh, with the corruption. So uh, Netanyahu, instead of really you know, trying to look around and try to uh, find out you know, how it happened that all of his ministers, almost all of them, his chief of staff, his closest uh, people, people that worked with him all the time, uh, now, uh, you know, uh, subject of uh, investigations and corruption. Instead of that, uh, he uh, traditionally he maintains, you know, his criticism of, of journalists and the end of uh, end of the left. And I'm thinking, you know, that uh, uh, it's just basically says that the journalists did something right. Uh, the role of journalism is to expose. Uh, the journal, the role of journalists is to protect the democracy. Uh, and the democracy, in our democracy, uh, journalism is a very important pillar. Free press is a very important pillar. So we as opposition are obliged uh, also to fight against corruption, but also to defend the freedoms, freedoms such as freedom of speech uh, and spread freedom of press in our country. Now we know that Netanyahu is not the only Israeli leader uh, to have legal problems. Uh, former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, we actually have a graphic, was convicted 
of corruption. He served 16 months in prison. Then we had former Interior Minister Arya Deri, who was convicted of taking bribes. He spent 22 months in prison. Former President Moshe Katsav was actually convicted of rape, and he was incarcerated for five years. So Israel has prosecuted and jailed a number of its politicians. Neri, let me ask you, has that been good for Israeli democracy? Or, as some argue, is it creating fatigue, some sort of scandal fatigue among the Israeli public now? I mean, I think overall it's quite good for Israeli democracy. No one is above the law, uh, not a president, not a prime minister, uh, not a senior ministers. So I think, I think overall it's good. Having said that, uh, every prime minister going back uh, about 20 years has been investigated by the police. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind, including, by the way, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in his first term in the 1990s. So all of these prime ministers have been investigated. Uh, only one has actually been uh, indicted and sent to prison. So in that sense, uh, there is a bit of fatigue uh, among the Israeli public uh, about, okay, another investigation, uh, another uh, corruption case. Uh, so that's kind of playing into Netanyahu's favor uh, because no one, uh, most of the public, I, would, I should say, uh, quite believes that he will, he will be gone so soon. Okay, Ksenia, let me ask you, going forward then with this case, there are concerns among some members of the Israeli public that Netanyahu has been able to kind of stack the justice system uh, in his favor. They're claiming that Abichai Mandelblit, the attorney general, is, well, Netanyahu is, as, is his political patron, uh, as, as one journalist actually put it. Um, and that there will not be able to be a fair investigation going forward against Netanyahu. Do you, do you share those same fears, or do you think the system in Israel is firmly independent enough? I do trust the Israeli system. We do have the system of checks and balances, and I trust that Avichai Mandelblit will eventually do what he's supposed to do. And uh, I can tell you that, uh, for me, I participate on a weekly basis on demonstrations that are now happening in many Israeli cities. These demonstrations are against corruption. They are not against uh, Avichai Mandelblit or any other uh, person who is now uh, a part of the investigation process. We are not trying to influence them. We are only trying to say to them, this is important to us. Israeli public is watching you. We are watching you, and we are knowing what are you doing. So please be careful, and please do your job the way that we expect you to do. Uh, we do not know what will be the outcome. However, you know, uh, we do know that, uh, for example, since the, the demonstrations began, first in Petah Tikva, it's the city of uh, Avichai Mandelblit, uh, and then in uh, many other cities across uh, Israel, uh, then uh, the tempo uh, of the investigation uh, and of uh, working and of uh, um, information that we are getting uh, increased, you know, so it means that public pressure works. And Neri, it seemed you had a comment. I should mention uh, to the viewers that these demonstrations are in front of the Attorney General's home. Uh, so in that sense, it doesn't seem like a great vote of confidence uh, by the opposition, by the Labour Party, uh, in this individual's professionalism, in this individual's uh, independence. And I will say, just as an outside observer, as a journalist, um, I think it's playing into Netanyahu's hands. Uh, when opposition members uh, from parliament, uh, partisan members of, of the Knesset, go and demonstrate against the Attorney General, um, it creates this impression of outside pressure on the Attorney General to take certain decisions against the Prime Minister. Ksenia, and I would think you... in that sense, politically, it's counterproductive. Would you agree, uh, Ksenia, that there's a risk there? No, I do not believe that. Uh, you know, uh, we are the opposition, and we are ought to do what the opposition has to do. Uh, we object uh, to the corruption in our country. Uh, we know that uh, it didn't start with Netanyahu, but it doesn't give any reason to exempt Netanyahu now from the investigations and so on. Uh, the investigation, in our uh, opinion, takes more time than it should be. However, it doesn't say anything about the integrity of the Attorney General. We do trust him as an honest man. We do trust that he's an honest man, so, that he will do his job. However, so you know, uh, our uh, goal is why? to indicate also to Netanyahu, or indicate it also to Netanyahu, indicate it also to Mandblit, that we are watching, 
We are watching, we are there, and we are not, you know, we will not let it to just, you know, uh, go on forever, you know. So the stalemate will not be acceptable. Go, uh, because okay. we are talking about the Prime Minister. We know that Netanyahu himself, when he was a Prime Minister, he said, just I'm finishing, right. he said that uh, it's not possible that the uh, Dolmert, who used to be a Prime Minister, will continue his job while he's being investigated in so many cases. He cannot stand the pressure. Okay, but Neri, you, you say if they trust the Attorney General, why are they demonstrating right outside his house? That's correct. That's my point to, mm. to the member of Knesset. Uh, it's something they should really take into account because we see it playing into Netanyahu's hands. Uh, so if you are actually demonstrating uh, against corruption in the Israeli political system, uh, take it perhaps away from the Attorney General's house and make it a wider and broader movement. Uh, by the way, their impression of the Attorney General uh, changed It is wider and broader. I'm, uh, I'm going to the, the demonstration in Modin every week, for example. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, it great, is broad and wide, and I can tell you that uh, since uh, the last house. two weeks, we have many, many, uh, many, also many participants from the right, also even from the party of Benjamin Netanyahu, even people from the Likud coming to these demonstrations, and I expect that there will be more and more of them. Okay, quickly, Neri, I just want to ask you before we go, how well, long do, do you expect, we just have a minute left, how long do you expect this process to actually last? Net, net last, Netanyahu has always shown staying power in spite of all his political foes. He's not likely to succumb to any pressure here. When might we ever see a result? Uh, that's right. Look, he's a survivor. Uh, I think there's a legal process that will take months to play out. Uh, there's also a political process stemming from the investigations, stemming from uh, the legal process that might actually uh, be shorter. Uh, so in the coming months, we'll see if Netanyahu's political support inside his own party, inside his own government, uh, will hold while all these investigations are swirling and all these leaks uh, into the media about the investigations are actually happening. Okay. Neri Zilber and Ksenia Svetlova, I'd like to thank you both so much for joining us on The Newsmakers. That's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Andrea Sankey. Next time, we'll discuss if the honeymoon is over for French President Emmanuel Macron. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.